So welcome to our 31st Byrne Lecturer. I just counted it. Um, I'm Joel Harrington. I'm the chair of the history department. And it's a great pleasure for us to have Peter Kerklaus here today. I'm going to say something briefly. I have to really look up in this room. <laughs> something briefly about the Byrne Lecture and its history, of course. And then I'm going to turn things over to our colleague, David Carlton, who will introduce our speaker for today. So the, the Byrne Lecture Series began in 1986 out of a long-staying interest of John W. Byrne in world history and the philosophy of history, particularly in connection with the ideas of Arnold Toynbee, the once renowned philosopher and historian. I imagine a lot of younger people in the crowd wonder, who is this person? Byrne's path to the study of Toynbee, which verged on an obsession in later life, was an unusual one that reveals something both about Arnold Toynbee's remarkable appeal to all kinds of readers during the mid-20th century and about Mr. Byrne's own unswerving interest in the world around him. Mr. Byrne began his career as an educator. He took his BA at Peabody College for Teachers, which is now part of Vanderbilt, and continued his education at Stanford University where he earned an MA in 1932. He spent 20 years as a school teacher and administrator in Dixon County, a rural county to the west of Nashville. Sometime in the late 1940s, he launched a successful career as a real estate developer in Dixon County and became a man of modest wealth. When he retired in 1969, he made the dissemination of Toynbee's ideas his chief application. Byrne believed that Toynbee supplied answers to many of this planet's most pressing problems and he sought nothing less than to solve these problems by spreading the word in college essay contests, in lectures, and symposia across the country. In a book of Toynbee essays he edited and published, and not least, in funding this series of lectures at Vanderbilt University. And don't worry, you don't have to mention <laughs> Toynbee at all. <laughs> He's, Peter's looking. <laughs> in 1979, he made a gift to the university, initially to sponsor a course taught by the recently arrived Paul Conkin. It was some time later at Compton's suggestion that the history department recommended that the best way to further Mr. Byrne's educational aims was to sponsor a lecture series named for him focused either on Toynbee and his disciples or on broad questions in world history or the philosophy of history. John Byrne attended each of the first three lectures of the new series before his own death in September 1988. Every year since 1986, so 30 years, a historian of proven and widely recognized distinction has been invited to Vanderbilt to lecture on the kind of broad historical themes that Toynbee himself so memorably addressed. So as I said, it's a great pleasure to welcome our 31st current lecturer, and I'm going to turn it over to David Carlton to introduce him to you. Peter will be relieved to know that I'm not working off an eye. Uh, uh, close to 40 years ago, as I was struggling to establish myself while living on a shoestring in Columbia, South Carolina, rumors began to circulate that there was a hotshot graduate student working at Columbia University on a Brodellian interpretation of the South Carolina Low Country. Eyes rolled all over the South Carolina <laughs> Library, but we were nonetheless intrigued enough to want to lay those eyes on this person. Well, we finally got our wish in 1979 when he took up residence in the mornings on the front portico of the SCL. <laughs> he soon became part of the core of what became a remarkable rotating group of historical researchers, one that included, from time to time, the future president of Harvard. Exchanges of ideas soon led to collaboration and close friendships that have come to last a lifetime. We also came to know well one of the most remarkable scholars of my generation I have ever known. Peter Angelo Kaklanis is a native of the Chicago West Side, a good working class Greek stock. To this day, he holds a Teamsters Union card, um, and did his undergraduate work at Drake University before heading to Columbia, where he worked under the business historian Stuart Boucher. His dissertation, The Shadow of a Dream, Economic Life and Death in the South Carolina Low Country, 1670, 1920, about as long durée as you can get in American history, um, won the Alan Nevins Prize of the Society of American Historians. 
awarded to the best written dissertation in American history of the previous year. It was published by Oxford University Press in 1989. He has been a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill since 1984, and since 2001 has held the Albert R. Newsom Distinguished Professor. He has served a term as chair of the UNC History Department and has taken on other major administrative positions, including Associate Provost for International Affairs and Director of the University Center for International Studies. He played a major role in establishing what is now the FedEx Global Education Center at UNC, a model of its kind, uh, and founded and currently directs UNC's Global Research Institute. He has also been a fellow of the Charles Warren Center at Harvard and has held the Raffles Distinguished Professorship in Southeast Asian History at the National University of Singapore. Peter's record of scholarship has been breathtaking, both in its volume and in its range. His CV runs to 51 pages. Um, he has authored, co-authored, or edited 11 books, two in collaboration with me, uh, dealing with subjects as varied as the economic development of the American South, uh, the economic development of Southeast Asia, uh, business and economic history more generally, including the exciting subfield of anthropometric history, in which the Vanderbilt Econ Department has just made a hire, and the global history of commodities, especially rice. In addition, he has produced a vast swarm of articles, book reviews, and occasional pieces, frequently straying from his core scholarly concerns to touch on current affairs and sports. He has, of course, given his roots an Arden Cubs fan, <laughs> although his loyalty to the Tar Heels is, shall we say, equivocal. <laughs> um, in short, we have in Peter Kaklanis a scholar of awesome energy, vast range, and not least style. I offer you the 31st Burn Lecturer. Wow. Thank you very much. It's hard to recognize who he was speaking about. Um, let me uh, begin by thanking everyone uh, involved in this lecture series. I'd like to thank the Byrne Lecture Committee, uh, especially Samira Sheik, as well as the chair of the History Department, Joel Harrington, my longtime friend and collaborator, David Carlton, the History Department in general, and Vanderbilt University for the gracious invitation and warm hospitality. I have many friends here and have visited on a number of occasions, uh, and it's always a pleasure uh, to return. Now, as David said, I'm an economic historian, and some of you in the audience probably don't know what an economic historian is. It's a small field. Someone wants to define an economic historian as someone who likes numbers, but lacks sufficient charm, grace, or wit to make it as an accountant. Uh, <laughs> Today, though, I'll be talking about Southeast Asia in context. The subject tonight, Southeast Asia, in some ways is the Rodney Dangerfield of world regions. <laughs> Why do I say this? Because Southeast Asia gets little respect or at least attention from historians in the US. To wit, Southeast Asia, despite its size and importance, is and always has been a small field Moreover, it has generally been considered, at least in the United States, a minor field. The largest professional organization in the US for scholars of Asia is the interdisciplinary group called the AAS, the Association for Asian Studies, which hosted a huge meeting last weekend in Seattle. Of its thousands of members, only 12% identify themselves as Southeast Asianists and the AAS includes Sri Lanka and Bangladesh in its Southeast Asian classification, which countries are almost never included in standard Southeast Asian classification schemes elsewhere. Within history per se, the place of Southeast Asia is more marginal still. According to the AHA's 2015 Directory of History Departments, covering the US and Canada, about 9.4% of historians are Asianists of any sort. Now, the AHA breaks down its own membership by field, 
And of the 7,986 AHA members who have listed a geographic specialization in 2015, 858, or 10.7%, self-identified geographically as Asianists, meaning that Asianists are slightly overrepresented uh, among AHA members in comparison to the members of history departments listing in the directory. Now among AHA members though, only 145, about 16% of Asianists, and only about 1.8 of all members of the AHA self-identifying by geographical interest are Southeast Asianists, a paltry figure indeed. Before going on, let me thank Michael Paschal, the Executive Director of the AAS, and Liz Townsend, co Coordinator of Professional Data at the AHA, for providing me with the above data. Now, my point regarding the marginal place of Southeast Asian history and history departments in the U.S. and Canada is captured in other ways as well. Neither Vanderbilt nor UNC Chapel Hill, where I teach, has a dedicated Southeast Asianist in the history department, though both schools have people who work a bit at the margins of Southeast Asian history, whether in history or cognate departments. Indeed, at UNC at least, we've never had a full-time permanent line in Southeast Asian history. Similarly, today, a, no, a number of other large distinguished departments, such as Brown, Emory, Johns Hopkins, NYU, and the University of Texas, Austin, lack historians specializing in Southeast Asia. Though here again, they have some scholars working at the margins in East Asia, South Asia, and Asian migration, etc. Moreover, most of the history departments that do show the flag in Southeast Asian history uh, often have someone working on modern Vietnam for, for obvious reasons. From an American perspective, there's little wonder why. When I was chair of history uh, at UNC Chapel Hill in the late 90s and early part of the 21st century, we once tried to recruit an eminent Southeast Asianist from an Ivy League school. Things were going well, but the recruitment came a cropper. One reason being that neither UNC nor Duke uh, in their library holdings, which combined constitute one of the largest collections in the United States, had much in the way of Southeast Asian holdings, but for a few isolated areas of specialization. Uh, and I, uh, I suspect that many other U.S. institutions are in similar or worse straits in terms of library holdings. Now, why such scholarly disrespect, uh, which disrespect has resulted in relative neglect? I think there are a variety of reasons. Southeast Asia is a vague, amorphous, ambiguous space to begin with. People, and all, people often are unclear about where it is, of what it is constituted, hence the map upstairs, or uh, above my head. The answer in brief is that it, Southeast Asia today is, is constituted by 11 countries, the ASEAN nations, plus uh, East Timor, Timor Leste. Ceylon or Sri Lanka was once considered part of Southeast Asia, but later was moved into the South Asian grouping. Conversely, the Philippines shifted over from East Asia to Southeast Asia in most scholarly works beginning in the, in the mid-1950s with the first edition of DGE Hall's kind of classic history of Southeast Asia. Moreover, as you can see, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the so-called Indian Ocean would seem by location to be in Southeast Asia, but they're controlled by India and are generally treated as part of South Asia. Now, without going the analytic philosophy route, invoking Saul Kripke and the like, in the case of Southeast Asia, it is necessary to mention, if only briefly, the complicated relationship between names and things. For what we today call Southeast Asia is a proper noun that came into being rather late in the game. Another reason, alas, for the region's murkiness, even today. Speaking of names, this rather fugitive region has had a variety of names over the years, often given to it by outsiders, and often referring to what it was not, rather than to what it is. In the past, the area was often referred to as Nanyang, a term used first by the Chinese to denote the land of the Southern Oceans sometimes referred to as well as the land below the winds, uh, referring to the monsoon. Anthony Reed, 
entitled Volume 1 of his two-volume Braudelian-like study of early modern Southeast Asia, the lands below the winds. The area was sometimes referred to by European imperial administrators, particularly British, as Further India. It is sometimes incorporated into a large, rather vague entity called Monsoon Asia. The actual term Southeast Asia itself didn't really become common until World War II, when it was employed to denote areas in Asia, south of China and east of India, invaded, occupied, and controlled by the Japanese during the war. So the various names associated with the region have inhibited what might be called the thing building or identity formation process. Then there is the tremendous diversity of the 11 nations today considered part of Southeast Asia, which diversity has hindered outsiders and even insiders from taking in the region as a whole. These nations range from tiny to huge. You have Brunei, a little speck with 430,000 people on the island of Borneo, to Indonesia with 256 million people, the fourth largest country in the world behind China, India, and the United States. You have very rural areas like Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar, and a place that's entirely 100% urban in Singapore. Southeast Asia includes some of the richest countries on earth, Singapore and Brunei, and some very, very poor countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Timor-Leste. The geographic sweep of the area also inhibits comprehension. The region stretches thousands of miles from east to west, for example, and one country, the Philippines, consists of around 7,000 islands and another, Indonesia, depending on who's counting, has between 13,500 and 17,000 islands in that grouping. All of this diversity makes it, hard, makes it hard to come to terms, much less to grips, with Southeast Asia. There are other forms of diversity that inhibit coherence as well. The different histories and trajectories of mainland and island areas, for example. There are historical and cultural differences often profound between lowland areas and lowland peoples on the one hand and hill country peoples. Many of the latter can be viewed as the population in the zone James Scott refers to as Zomia in his Anarchist History of Upland Southeast Asia, The Art of Not Being Governed, published in 2009. There are big differences between Sinic and Indic areas areas influenced historically and culturally primarily by China or by India. There's tremendous religious variation, various forms of Islam, although most are uh, Sunnis in the area, various forms of Buddhism, there, is a Bo uh, there are Hindu areas such as Bali, and also Christianity, animism, and the like. There's variation due to European colonizing power. All Southeast Asian nations, but in a, for uh, Thailand in a titular sense, were uh, controlled uh, by European colonies for a time. And even Thailand was heavily influenced, if not informally controlled, by Great Britain, which along with France found it in its interest, in its imperial interest, to maintain Siam as independent as kind of a buffer state between the British and French imperial possessions on the Southeast Asian mainland. In more recent times, the region's own inability to present itself coherently and forcefully as a unit on the world stage also inhibits comprehension. Think back a bit about the risibly weak regional security pact organization known as CEDO. Uh, which existed between 1954 and 1977, most of the members of which were from Southeast Asia. It was a kind of an attenuated analog of NATO, orchestrated by the U.S. and its allies. Uh, and frankly, you could even think of ASEAN, which, though growing a bit stronger in recent years, is still rather flimsy and weakly integrated in structural, operational, and functional terms. Uh, we'll come back to this point later when I argue that uh, this ostensible weakness might, in fact, in some other ways, be a source of strength. 
but up till now, uh, it's largely been a weakness. Now, despite all of the above qualifications, there are four points to note that will be part of the principal takeaways tonight. First, there is a coherence to Southeast Asia and some important similarities among the countries currently considered part of it. Secondly, the region is, in fact, important in a variety of ways and certainly worthy of respect and systematic study. Thirdly, in many ways, it has arguably been the most global of all the world regions and has been so for several thousand years. And four, its history is embodied in and inscripted on its present configuration and as such may hold some lessons for us all. Drawing a loose analogy from the principle of actualism in geology, one of the guiding principles in that discipline, I am proceeding this afternoon under the premise that the present is the key, or at least one key, to the past. I will also be talking big picture, big questions this afternoon, pursuing a variant of what Andre Gunder Frank has called, rather inelegantly, horizontally integrated macro history, end quote. In some ways, the talk comports in spirit with the work of advocates of so-called big history, such as Daniel Smale and David Christian, with David Armitage and Joe Goldie's recent history manifesto, and in a rather loose way, even with the work of Jared Diamond and Yuval Noah Harari and Sapiens. So let's talk now just for a little bit about some of the forces that I argue are making for coherence and similarities in Southeast Asia and its history. All the countries share a tropical climate. As U.B. Phillips said, let us begin with the climate with reference to the South, but I think in Southeast Asia, the fact that it has a tropical climate and all of these countries are heavily influenced by the monsoon, or rather monsoons, summer flowing from the Southwest, winter flowing from the Northeast. There's a heavy influence in all of these countries early on on migration into the region by outside peoples, whether Mons, Khmers, or Tibetans, which peoples comprise a good part of the ethnic base of Southeast Asia's population even today and certainly historically. In all of the nations in Southeast Asia, there have been strong cultural and often political influences from outside throughout the whole history of this era, although very area, although varying in different parts of the region and different periods. India, China, Islam, particularly uh, in the insular parts or island parts of Southeast Asia and coastal parts of the mainland, and the West through colonial and neo-colonial policies have all had a profound influence on Southeast Asia. And the West here is the full Monty, as it were, Portuguese, Spanish, the Dutch, the British, the French, and the US. And there's also the short but intense imperial role from another outside power, the Japanese, during World War II when they controlled almost all of Southeast Asia. Now keep in mind this point about the profound role of external influences in Southeast Asia, for we shall return to it later. Turning to the importance of Southeast Asia on the world stage, this can be demonstrated in myriad ways, including in cultural terms, to which anyone who loves Southeast Asian cuisines or has had the great good fortune to visit Angkor Wat, Bagan, Bora Badur, to see Balinese dance or Wayang Kulit puppetry, or to listen to a gamelan orchestra can attest. Here, though, I shall be sticking mainly to economics and geopolitics. Let's talk a little about the economic importance, uh, which I believe is profound. The 11 countries of Southeast Asia today have a combined population of 636 million, about 8 or 9 percent of, of the world's population, and a GDP of almost $2.5 trillion. Looked at from other perspectives, if Southeast Asia were one country, you know, they are a uh, kind of a geopolitical union in ASEAN, it would rank as the seventh largest in the world in nominal GDP. Alternatively, one can get a sense of the region's importance 
by noting that it is only about half the size of India, a card-carrying brick, and today the highest, flower, highest flying brick, but it has a considerably greater GDP than does India. Southeast Asian countries, generally speaking, uh, in an economic sense, are very open and trade-oriented. According to the World Bank in 2014, in six of the nine countries in Southeast Asia for which data exist, and that excludes Myanmar and Timor-Leste, the total value of exports and imports in terms of goods and services exceeded GDP sometimes by very significant margins. And this is kind of unusual in the entire world. In the case of Vietnam, for example, the trade GDP ratio is 170 to 100. And in Singapore, the ratio was a staggeringly high 351 to 100, the second highest in the world after Hong Kong. That is to say the total value of exports and imports is three and a half times GDP. By way of comparison, the ratio in the United States is about 31 to 100, and in the world as a whole, just under 60 to 100. Southeast Asia also includes two of the wealthiest nations in the world in purchasing power parity terms. Singapore, with a PPP GDP per capita, estimated at about $86,000 in July 2015, and Brunei at about $80,000. By comparison, the United States at the time is about 56,000, and the average in the world as a whole was about $15,800. Speaking in qualitative terms, the region, qua region, has a large diverse factor product and consumer uh, market, and lots of natural resources, oil, gas, mineral deposits, tropical forests, rich agricultural lands, fisheries, and bountiful rivers and seas. Moreover, but for Singapore, and to a lesser extent Thailand, the countries in their region are all very young, with growth-oriented demographic profiles, a very small elderly population, and lots of people in uh, the labor-intensive years of 15 to 60. It is very diverse economically, with lots of heterogeneity. Some areas in the region can provide very cheap labor, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, increasingly Myanmar, Vietnam. And some of this labor, particularly in Vietnam, is surprisingly skilled. Other areas can offer more skilled labor at affordable prices, particularly Thailand and Malaysia, while both of these countries may be falling into the so-called middle income trap, which I'll talk about later. Singapore, of course, offers top-of-the-line skilled labor and excellent logistics and port services, entrepreneur services, banking and the like. And the area as a whole has improving air logistics. And of course the area is located on the world's greatest sea lanes, the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea, and is in close proximity to both India and China, as you can see above. Now invoking India and China provides a nice segue into geopolitics. For those two outside powers can help us to understand Southeast Asia's growing geopolitical importance. There are many illustrations of the geopolitical importance of the region, and I'll just mention a few here. President Obama's pivot to Asia included uh, a, a firm positioning in Southeast Asia. The growing military rivalries in both the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. China versus Japan in the South China Sea, China versus Taiwan, China versus all of the Southeast Asian nations except Laos and uh, Timor-Leste, China versus the United States, and in the Indian Ocean, China versus India. The rivalries over influence in one of Asia's last frontiers, Myanmar, much in the news these days, with India, China, the West, Japan, and other Southeast Asian nations, particularly Singapore, vying for influence. Human rights issues such as human trafficking, mistreatment of minority groups such as the Rohingya, refugee issues are prominent in Southeast Asia as well. And environmental issues are huge, huge as Donald Trump would say, and growing ever huger. Deforestation, particularly in Indonesia, and human-induced climate change issues are proving great challenges 
in particular the dam building uh, by the Chinese on the upper Mekong. There are now something like 40 to 50 dams being built which are basically cutting the water supply of fresh water into the lower Mekong at the same time that human climate change is causing seafloor rising, which is leading to saltwater inundation in the delta areas, uh, especially in Vietnam and Cambodia. China's recently announced One Belt, One Road initiative launched in September of 2013 by Xi Jinping the maritime part of which will attempt to recreate the routes through Southeast Asia between Asia, Africa, and Europe. The threats posed by Islamic extremist groups in Southeast Asia, particularly in Indonesia and the Philippines, but also in Malaysia, Southern Thailand, and even in Singapore, are also of geopolitical note. Now many of these issues and others, such as the drug trade, are treated in some detail in recent works. One thinks of Robert Kaplan's books, uh, and I won't uh, belabor the, the point tonight, but clearly Southeast Asia, uh, in Southeast Asia, geopolitical matters uh, are very important. Now let's turn to Southeast Asia and globalization uh, and get a little bit more historical. That Southeast Asia, so often neglected and or misunderstood, is important to other parts of the world today may be surprising to us, but it shouldn't be. If the region registered on the American psyche beginning in the 1960s, during the American phase of the Vietnam War, the region was firmly ensconced in world circuits and orbits considerably earlier, to the tune of about 2,300 years earlier. The main title of my talk tonight, Six Flags Over Malacca, is suggestive in this regard. The title was intentionally playful, referring at once to the large Texas-based amusement park company Six Flags Over Texas, and to the fact that Malacca, like Texas, home of the first Six Flags Park in Arlington, has been governed by six entities over its history. Since its establishment about 1400 in the Common Era, on the uh, site of a Malay fishing village on the west coast of what is now Peninsular <laughs> Malaysia, Malacca has been under the control of the Malacca Sultanate, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, the Japanese, the British again, and then in 1957, Malaya, Malaysia. <laughs> the, title was meant, uh, tonight, the title of today's talk was meant to convey something else as well, though the global character, not only of Malacca, which was a very significant port and emporium in the early modern period, but also of Southeast Asia more generally, stretching a long time back. Now the global character of Malacca can be signified in many ways. The illustrious Chinese eunuch Admiral uh, Zheng He visited the city on five of his seven great expeditions in the early 15th century the first, the third, the fourth, and the seventh. And numerous accounts exist from early European travelers documenting both the commercial importance and the cosmopolitan nature of the city of Malacca. Most notably, the famous Portuguese travelers uh, Duarte Barbosa, who died with Magellan in the Philippines in 1521, and even more emphatically, Tomé Perez, the apothecary merchant factor whose detailed account of Asian trade, the Summa Oriental, was published in India and Malacca between 1512 and 1515. Indeed, Perez's account makes Malacca, just after the Portuguese takeover, sound much like an entrepot such as Singapore today. According to Perez's account, in the early 16th century, the port was chock full of merchants from all areas of the rich and sophisticated trading world stretching from China to Egypt. He claims that 84 languages were spoken there at the time, and comments at length on the port's wealth, its low taxes, the dazzling array of currencies being exchanged there, and the sophisticated commercial practices of the port's merchants and bankers. Even after the arrival of the Portuguese in the new era of militarized trade uh, that they brought with them, which era K.M. Panikar famously referred to long ago as the age or the epoch of Vasco da Gama, Malacca was to remain a significant port, 
largely because of its strategic location on the eponymous Straits of Malacca, until being superseded by nearby Singapore in the early 19th century. Now today the city is no longer a major entrepot, but a minor trading and manufacturing center and getaway site for recreation and entertainment, heritage tourism, and increasingly medical tourism. But in the 16th century, Malacca rocked the world, or at least large parts of the Eurasian commercial portions thereof. And as an expression of broader economic forces in Southeast Asia, Malacca in the 16th century was not an anomaly, much less unique, for local, regional, and long distance trade and perforce concentrated trade centers and sites were common, even characteristic, of large parts of Southeast Asia, particularly maritime Southeast Asia, for almost two millennia before Tomei Perez found himself in that part of the world. Now much ink has been spilt and battles fought over globalization, as Americans who have been following the presidential primaries this year know all too well, alas. Rather than debate the pros and cons of globalization right now, let me just say a few words regarding the approach I will be using when employing the G word, which will focus almost exclusively on economic criteria. As we'll see, even so limited and demarcated, that is quite broad enough. Now economists, sociologists, and historians who've been studying economic globalization, whether contemporary or historical, have employed a plethora of definitions or more broadly approaches in so doing. Some such definitions or approaches emphasize qualitative concerns and others quantitative measurable variables. Adopting a narrow quantitative definition or approach, one finds that many writers, including Paul Krugman, for example, see globalization as denoting changes in the absolute size of measurable transnational economic flows of one type or another, whether it's trade, capital, or people, or more fruitfully in the relative importance of such flows. For example, if, if global trade is proceeding more rapidly than is global GDP over a considerable period of time, one could say using this narrow economistic approach or definition that economic globalization is occurring. Others prefer, prefer less parsimonious approaches to globalization, however, emphasizing or at least bringing into play qualitative experiential criteria. For our purposes as historians, such pro approaches often seem more fruitful, particularly as we move further into the past into periods when good quantitative data are often lacking. What are these qualitative considerations uh, that are employed? Well, typically such things as changes in states of mind, changes in behaviors, perceptions about economic opportunities, problems, pressures, and challenges. Such considerations can help to flesh out and contextualize the extant quantitative evidence in one or another historical setting. Here we find writers focusing on states, some writers focus on changes in states of mind as a result of what might be termed a quote, comp compression of space and time, sometimes radical in nature due to qualitative changes in economic life. In this regard, the aforementioned uh, Thomas Friedman, for example, focuses on widespread changes in feelings and perceptions today as people increasingly sense the pressure and see the opportunities occasioned by changes in economic life. In some ways, Friedman's approach, sparked by our current phase of globalization, is not all that different than that articulated by the great French historian that David evoked earlier on, Ferdinand Braudel, writing in Capitalism and Material Life about early capitalism and the changes it occasioned in the sensibilities of many. Now other writers try to be more precise, even when dealing with qualitative considerations. Social theorist Manuel Castells, for example, writing with reference to today's phase of globalization, argues that a globalizing economy is one that increasingly operates as a unit in real time on a planetary basis. As a unit in real time on a planetary basis. Considered in that way, globalization is a recent phenomenon indeed. But economist Ann Kruger is much more latitudinarian, seeing globalization as a rather vague phenomenon, is the word to use, I would prefer process, 
that occurs when, and I quote, economic actors in any given part of the world are much more affected by events elsewhere in the world, end quote, than before. Now here Kruger, who had a distinguished career in both acad the academy at, and at the IMF and the World Bank, sounds something like the classical Greek historian Polybius, who lived from 203 to 120 BCE. Writing in the histories about the state of the world, as it were, during his lifetime, Polybius writes, now up to this time, the world's history had been, so to speak, a series of disconnected transactions, as widely separated in their origins and results as in their localities. But from this time forth, history becomes a connected whole. The affairs of Italy and Libya are involved with those of Asia and Greece, and the tendency of all is to unity. As you can see then, writing about globalization as a concept, let alone historically, is a difficult task. The difficulty of which is further exacerbated, as uh, the aforementioned David uh, Armitage has pointed out, because globalization can be considered either as a process or as a kind of permanent end state or condition. Now here, with reference to Southeast Asia, we'll employ the term as a process, a broad convoluted process at that, one with many twists and many turns. It was, as we shall see, a venerable process as well, one stretching back to the period when Polybius wrote, that is to say, in the third century BC. Now let me periodize Southeast Asia's globalization a little bit. Although hard figures are difficult, if not impossible, to come by, many, if not most, experts on Southeast Asia's early economic history believe that the region partook in the process Polybius was describing the pickup in Eurasian trade flows over land and maritime beginning in the third century BCE. This pickup was associated with the establishment of the Han, Miura, and Parthian dynasties in that century and trade connections among them. These connections overland and especially maritime spread elsewhere as well both to other parts of what the great Southeast Asianist O.W. Walters referred to as the single ocean, which is the Indian Ocean broadly conceived, all the way to the Hellenistic world, as Polybius noted. Moreover, it was such broad Eurasian, or more properly Afro-Eurasian trade connections that have led scholars such as Andre Gunder Frank, Barry Gills, and Samir Amin to date the beginnings of what they call the world economy, or at least a world economy, to the third century BC. Now whether or not we choose to follow them, it does seem clear that beginning in that century, we see the creation of a new multi-layered long distance trade axis stretching from the Mediterranean to China. And that in Kruger's terms, the economy of this vast region was more integrated than it had ever been before. In early Southeast Asia, commercially precocious as it was, according to Tony Reed, was part and parcel of this axis of this emerging quote unquote world economy. Now to be sure, any part of globalization, any sort of globalization before the 19th century, or to be more specific, before the advent of the telegraph and the transoceanic cable and the theoretical possibility at least of instantaneous communication differs dramatically from the type of integration and trade links that followed. This has led eminent scholars such as C.A. Bailey and A.G. Hopkins, and actually your dean, uh, Laurie Benton, to use terms such as archaic globalization and proto-globalization to refer to pre-19th century forms. Whatever term we opt for, though, it is clear that trade and other long-distance flows over, across, around, and through large parts of Afro-Eurasia were often more regular, organized, and significant than most scholars until recently have allowed. Although little quantitative information exists today in serial form regarding such trade, extant Asian and European sources have allowed scholars to reconstruct the products, goods, and articles involved in local, regional, and long-distance trade involving Southeast Asia beginning in this period. Interestingly enough, many of the goods and products will not surprise audiences today. Raw materials, foodstuffs, fish and sea products, lumber and forest products, 
gems, spices, cloth, handicrafts, and preciosities of one type or another, edible bird's nests, and things like that. For in varying combinations, such goods and products really characterized trade in Southeast Asia until the 19th century. After this early phase of Afro-Eurasian globalization, beginning in the third century BCE, we find, not surprisingly, ebbs and flows of this process over ensuing centuries. The eastern and westernmost appendages of these trade networks may have atrophied a bit, first uh, uh, with the fall first of the Hans and then of Rome, although Oxford historian Peter Frankopan's just released book, The Silk Roads, makes such an assumption questionable. But trade in Walter's one ocean, the Indian Ocean, was little affected by either development. Regarding the Silk Road routes, for example, the Southeast Asia was integral to both land and sea-based pathways connecting China uh, and India by land via the Kra Isthmus in, uh, between present-day Thailand and Malaysia and via water through the Straits of Malacca. Whether or not a slowdown occurred with the fall of the Hans in Rome, there does seem to have been a nice pickup in long-distance trade throughout Afro-Eurasia, including Southeast Asia, as early as the 6th century in the Common Era, according to John Hobson, with a further boost in the 7th and 8th centuries CE, a boost coinciding with the installations of the storied Tang dynasty in China and the Abbasid, or the Sunni Caliphate, in present-day Iraq. The reestablishment of Pan-Asian trade and the robustness of the extra-regional trade networks associated therewith has led John Hobson to date the beginning of what he calls the era of Oriental despotism, even before the arrival on the scene of the Tongs and the Abbasids. Now, time does not permit close analysis of each and every turn uh, regarding global Southeast Asia over the ensuing centuries. Suffice it to say this afternoon that the region's economic engagement with Afro-Eurasia stayed strong throughout the heydays of the Tongs and Abbasid rule. Long distance extra regional trade with both China and the West may have receded a bit with the fall of the Tongs and the decline of the Caliphate in the 10th century CE before picking up again between the 11th and 13th centuries with the rise of both the Song and significant land-based polities on mainland Southeast Asia itself, such as Bagan, Anger of the Angkor Wat uh, complexes, Dai Viet, and Champa. As such, the region clearly figured in what Janet Abu Lagod sees as a functional and functioning world economic system, as she puts it, before European hegemony. Indeed, a study published by the National Academy of Sciences in 2007 demonstrated pretty conclusively that Angkor, the capital city of the Khmer Empire in central Cambodia today, was by far the largest pre-industrial city in the world at its peak in the 11th century CE, the center of an urban sprawl of more than 1,000 square kilometers, that is to say about 390 square miles, with the main city itself having over a million people. And this empire flourished for six centuries, from the 9th to the 15th century CE. Now that said, the region experienced changes in the ensuing centuries. Scholars of all stripes seem to agree that once the Mongols uh, came uh, into power in China, there was a shift in economic priorities there, the long distance trade dimensions of which emphasize land-based Silk Road routes rather more than maritime routes focused in Southeast Asia which hurt Southeast Asian trade in the 14th century. But by the 15th century, Southeast Asia's regional and long-distance trade was again picking up, to which Zheng He's voyages and Tony Reed's Age of Commerce nomenclature, 1450 to 1680, attest. And, it was he saw, and as we saw earlier, the Portuguese penetration of Southeast Asia in the early 16th century was one manifestation of the region's increasing global connections the growing inroads into maritime Southeast Asia made by Islam during that period being another. Since the time of the region's age of commerce, Southeast Asia has been firmly integrated into global orbits and circuits, the sense of both global and integration becoming greater and greater all the time. 
the circumnavigation of the Earth by Magellan ships between 1519 and 1522 was a powerful suggestion of things to come, as, of course, was the fact that Magellan himself wasn't around for the completion of the circuit, having been killed, and some say eaten, by local tribesmen at the Battle of Mactan, an island a few kilometers uh, away from Cebu in the southern Philippines in 1521. Such integration isn't complete even today, however, 500 years after the symbolic suggestion of the same with uh, Magellan's circumnavigation of the Earth. Even in an era when companies such as Magellan Navigation, a Silicon Valley-based maker of GPS technology, seems to suggest otherwise. Indeed, as will be seen shortly, the fact that integration isn't complete, particularly regarding Southeast Asia, offers scholars some intriguing possibilities going forward. Now, first things first, however, we have at long last come to the 16th century CE in Southeast Asia and to Tommy Perez and Duarte Barbosa. To riff on T.S. Eliot and Little Gidding in his fourth quartet, although this is not the end of our exploring tonight, in arriving back where we started, I hope we know the piece at least a little bit better, if not for the first time. That is to say, when the Portuguese and Spanish and thence the Dutch, the English, the French, and later the Americans began to penetrate Southeast Asia economically, beginning in the 16th century CE, they were entering into an already rich, dense, sophisticated trading world, one that had been developing for centuries, if not millennia, without them. Thank you. But once Europeans entered, they found trade articles of great interest and trade value at home most notably, or at least famously, spices, cinnamons, cloves, nutmeg, and mace, and the like. Regarding the latter two spices, it is always fun and telling to note that the English and the Dutch spent much of the period between 1616 and 1667 battling for control of the little island of Run in the Banda Island group in what is now eastern Indonesia and the Moluccas, before the Treaty of Breda at the culmination of the Second Anglo-Dutch War in 1667, uh, which settled things. In the treaty, the Dutch happily ceded the settlement of New Amsterdam, that is to say New York, to the English in order to retain control of Run, the principal source of nutmeg and mace in the East Indies. And the Dutch retained a pretty complete monopoly on the provision of these two spices in the West until the early 19th century. This said, in the great scheme of things, it must be remembered that for two centuries, the European thrust into Southeast Asia was relatively modest, at least in terms of the Western footprint in the region as a whole. What it amounted to, basically, was control of uh, some coastal trade factories, reinforced by militari militarization of trade, and the redirection of a small part of Southeast Asia's trade toward the West. By and large, Asia was still largely Asian. If the hugely important work of members of the so-called California School of Early Modernists, Frank, Pomerantz, Bin Wong, Partha Sarathi, Robert Marx, Hobson, Flynn, and Geraldes, among others, can be reduced to one or two takeaways, it is that one, parts of Asia, South, East, and Southeast, places such as the Anxa Delta, the Rukyu Islands, basically Yokohama area, southern India, and various trade centers in both mainland and maritime Southeast Asia were much more developed and sophisticated than earlier Eurocentric accounts would have us believe, and two, that the West's will to power in Asia, including in Southeast Asia, came later and more violently than we have previously be, uh, been led to believe, and also that once there, the West redirected rather than initiated long-distance trade, and only a small part of it at that. In the case of Southeast Asia, real economic control by the West did not come until the 19th century, during which century, for a variety of reasons, Europeans were able successfully to project power of all kinds in the region, economic, technological, military, ideological, and ultimately geopolitical imperial, in ways that ushered in a new era in Southeast Asian history. It was during the long 19th century, particularly the latter half, stretching from 1850 to about 1920, 
uh, that almost all of Southeast Asia fell under European colonial control and that the region was incorporated into what both world system scholars and neoclassically oriented economic historians such as Jeffrey Williamson and Kevin O'Rourke refer to as the periphery. According to scholars of all stripes, the principal functions of Southeast Asia during that period, indeed, until well afterward, were to provide a broad array of raw materials and other primary products to the rapidly urbanizing, industrializing Western core. Products such as rice, sugar, coffee, indigo, and later copra, oil, ores, tin, rubber, gold, uh, coal, and palm oil as well, in exchange for manufactured goods and commercial services. This international division of labor, as it were, was realized more fully in some parts of Southeast Asia than in others. Under the British, for example, Burma, today's Myanmar, became almost the platonic ideal of an open, external, externally oriented and controlled economy. So much so that it was one of two such economies singled out by Jonathan Levin in his famous 1960 study, The Export Economies, Peru being the other. The economic effects of the reorientation of the region by Western colonial powers from the 19th century onward were varied and have been much debated. The Marxist notion of uneven and combined development, going back at least to Trotsky, captures in broad strokes what seems to have occurred for much of Southeast Asia as a result of the intensification of Western penetration and the reorientation of a number of Southeast Asian economies into export platforms controlled by a colonizing power. Suffice it to say that few see the long-term effects as having been salutary for the economic development of Southeast Asia. However much some entrepo areas, some political groups, and some uh, occupational categories may have benefited from the West's imperial control. Although the expansion of export complexes under Western auspices seem to have had some positive effects on income per capita uh, early on in this phase of Southeast Asia's global history, the late colonial period was marked by intermittent economic and political crises throughout Southeast Asia, perhaps related to the slowdown in world trade associated with the retreat from globalization between 1914 and 1945, an era many Marxists and others referred to as the Second Thirty Years War. And certainly, from a political or geopolitical standpoint, the colonial era ended badly almost everywhere in Southeast Asia. The decolonization of process at once accelerated, but complicated and arguably made much more difficult by Japan's colonial foray into the region between 1942 and 1945. After the war, the international economic architecture was rebuilt under US auspices, ushering in what might be called the Bretton Woods regime, the World Bank, the IMF, GATT, WTO, under which Southeast Asia and the rest of the world still operate, however unsteadily and unevenly. The bounds, participants, patterns, and effects of this regime have changed substantially, even profoundly in the 70-odd years in which it has been in place. Over the past 35 years in particular, as a result of the economic opening of China, the collapse of the Soviet Union, indeed of the entire second world, technological changes, including what Tom Friedman has called the democratization of finance, communication, and transportation, uh, which in turn encouraged the flattening that has made Friedman at least rich. These changes, generally speaking, spurred growth worldwide, in some cases at a pace that occasioned the invention of optimistic new acronyms such as the Little Tigers or the Little Dragons, as they Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, BRICS, or sometimes BICS, excluding Russia, the Civets, which Colombia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Egypt, Turkey, and South Africa, Beachy, I like that one, you say it with the Italian accent, Brazil, India, China, and Indonesia, the Mints, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, Turkey, as w there's also <coughs> Chindia, China, and India, and the grouping Jim O'Neill, who coined the acronym BRICS while working at Goldman Sachs in 2001, referred to in a recent book as, uh, called The Growth Map as the Next Eleven, 
Mexico, South Korea, Turkey, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Iran, Egypt, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Now, Southeast Asia's extremely diverse economies have experienced this period of intense and intensifying globalization in different ways, to be sure. But taken together, they have performed pretty well, certainly much better than less developed countries and emerging economies in any other part of the world over the past half century, even allowing for the Asian financial crisis of 1997-98, which some pundits, including the aforementioned Paul Krugman, referred to in a shorthand way as a bad case of botulism. Sorry about that one, you know, bots in Thailand. Certainly, the so-called big six, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, after the Doi Moi reforms of 86, and the Philippines, have enjoyed growth rates better than their counterparts in other parts of the non-West, basing their strategies, by and large, on economic openness and exports a diverse array of exports at that, and to a, uh, that have really uh, helped this area boom. Agricultural products, raw materials, and low value added, man value added manufacturers mainly, except for in Singapore, which is now a developed country, and to a lesser extent in Thailand, Malaysia, where there is a significant manufacturing sector, which have climbed a bit higher on the value chain but which may now be succumbing, as I suggested earlier, to the so-called middle income trap. That is to say, they're too expensive to compete at the low end, but insufficiently skilled to compete at the high end. In the case of Southeast Asia, political independence and the ability to direct economic life for national ends rather than for the good of a colonial power seems to have made a real difference in the effects of economic globalization rendering such effects much more positive than had been the case during the long 19th century. Now, we mentioned the external orientation of Southeast Asia's economies earlier, but let me mention here that such an orientation is apparent not only in tiny Singapore and in small countries such as Brunei, as is usually thought to be the case, but as I implied earlier, in Southeast Asia, uh, as well, uh, in, in larger countries as well. Malaysia has a trade GDP ratio today of 138 and a population of over 30 million. Thailand in 2014 had a trade to GDP ratio of 132 and a population of 68 million. And, you know, the poster child here, Vietnam, with its astounding trade to GDP ratio of 170 or so in a population of almost 100 million. These data, once again, are from the World Bank. Not for nothing, then, are four of the 12 Southeast Asian nations signatories to the controversial T TPP, Singapore, Brunei, Vietnam, and Malaysia. And if Indonesia climbs on, and President Joko Widodo has signaled he wants to, this pact will be huge indeed, whatever Paul Krugman might think. In any case, globalization in its most recent phase, the, the Bretton Woods architecture and the Pax Americana, which is considerably under threat from the PRC and the South China Sea, if not the Indian Ocean, has by and large been beneficial in economic terms to the grouping of nations falling under the Southeast Asia rubric. Whether or not this remains true growing forward, is difficult to say. As Yogi Berra and, and Niels Bohr both said, it's you know, difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Now, in terms of conclusions, earlier in the talk I made the case that historians have been very slow to recognize Southeast Asia as a region worthy of study, just as geographers and the population in general, at least in the West, for a variety of reasons, were slow to recognize the region uh, in what Wigan and Lewis would call their own personal metageographies. Although these facts have had some deleterious consequences for Southeast Asia, some of the factors responsible, the area's diversity, unwieldy boundaries, relative lack of regional sodality, its permeability, outward orientation, and susceptibility historically to outside influences, render it emblematic of and perhaps appropriate to our post-colonial, post-modern, post-everything times. Southeast Asia, simply put, at once conveys and captures the liminality, porosity, elusiveness of identity, ambiguities, 
and privileging of diversity characteristic of the early 21st century world. Such characteristics may ironically become regional strengths in the years ahead. Just as seemingly weak palm trees and many conifers seem to withstand strong storm winds better than most hardwoods, which seem indestructible, the lack of firm, fixed, venerable ties among the 11 nations of Southeast Asia may actually enable them to interact and engage each other more peacefully, profitably, and enduringly over time than one might expect. In the same way, perhaps, that distinguished sociologist and network theorist Mark Granovetter famously found in his classic paper, The Strength of Weak Ties, that such ties are often associated with more effective networks, networks which in his language uh, show more embeddedness than structures characterized by strong ties, looseness, porosity, openness, etc., as forces of good. If this is true, Southeast Asia may one day have a higher profile in the world and perhaps even in history departments in the West, for which 636 million and counting of the region's residents will respectively give thanks. Until that time, though, there are some, still some arbitrage possibilities out there, undervalued assets, as it were, that extra-regional scholars can exploit. Now, arbitrage is a term associated most closely with asset pricing in commodity markets. Predicated on the rejection of the assumptions of perfectly efficient markets, where all assets, commodities, products, etc., are fairly priced, arbitrage is defined as the simultaneous or near simultaneous buying and selling of a particular asset or assets in two or more markets, between which there are price differentials or discrepancies. In so doing, the arbitrageur, the person who transacts, aims to make a profit, and the overall effect of successful arbitrage in time is to eliminate differentials and thereby reduce market imperfections. And the key to arbitrage success is to discover and profit from identifying and redeploying undervalued assets. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about undervalued rice or palm oil here but undervalued ideas, methods, facts, information protocols, cultural practices, etc., of which there are large quantities still to be tapped in Southeast Asia. Not for nothing did three of the most distinguished and influential social thinkers of our age, Clifford Gertz, Benedict Anderson, and James Scott, base their greatest empirical and theoretical work on their experiences in Southeast Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, take heed. There is still plenty of material left for us, so let's roll up our sleeves. May the Asian pivot remain, well, pivotal. Thank you. We have time for some questions, and Professor Kaklanis has, has kindly agreed to field his own questions. Before we do, I just want to remind everybody we have a wonderful reception arranged over in the atrium of Butcher Hall, so please come join us when we're finished here. Sure. Yeah. So thanks very much for that strong case for Southeast Asian history. Um, so I, I had a question about one view that I didn't hear you mention, which is this idea of, of Warren in the Sulu zone, that this is a region that we should think of as uh, uh, in part connected by these networks involved in the trade and, and seizure of captives, mm -hmm. the seizure and trade of captives. Um, and uh, I, that, you know, he's looking particularly at the early 19th century, mm -hmm. but I, I, I wonder to what extent do you think that that kind of notion has a, a should have a greater place in the world as try to think about interconnected zones of captive trade. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I should have mentioned it. This was a, a very much a uh, kind of uh, drive-by look at Southeast Asian history. But uh, while it's hard to imagine, given the fact that it has 636 million people, historically Southeast Asia was relatively underpopulated by Asian standards. And labor was scarce in many parts of Southeast Asia. So the captive trade was always quite important. Uh, especially in the modern era when more routinized system, systematic labor needed to de be deployed. And so this is quite important, as it was everywhere 
uh, or in many parts of the world, especially in areas uh, without uh, very dense populations. I really neglected demographic concerns a lot here, even though I, I spend a lot of time doing Southeast Asian demographic history. One of the things I didn't mention either, which grows from this, is part of the labor uh, kind of world in motion in 19th century Southeast Asia involved India and China, for which the migration flows were much greater than they were uh, in the so-called new immigration to the United States and Latin America in the 19th century. At least 50 million Indians found themselves in various parts of Southeast Asia, the Americans, uh, the Americas between around 1850 and 1914, and roughly that many Chinese uh, uh, went back and forth throughout Southeast Asia in this period, particularly Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and uh, Burma. But that's a good point. I should have mentioned that, Larry. Thank you. Scott, uh, Geertz, and Anderson for at least 30 plus years, if not longer. Um, who should we be reading today? Who would be really interested in minds working on Southeast Asia, in your opinion? Boy, that's a good one. Uh, there are lots of uh, good scholars working on Southeast Asia right now. The thing that I think the area lacks right now is someone uh, equivalent to the people who have been reconstructing the history of first Chi early modern China and, and India uh, or South Asia during this period. They, Anthony Reed did some of this, uh, but most, I think, of the heavy lifting still needs to be done in the reconstruction of uh, Southeast Asian early modern history so that it will rise in significance to the same status as uh, that in uh, Parthasarathi's work and all these other guys who are working on, on China. There, is, uh, there are some collective projects going on uh, in, among Southeast Asianists. Um, uh, one very massive one on Indonesia, on the Indonesian economy from the 16th century to the present day and then uh, others uh, on, uh, on uh, coming out of the National University of Singapore. I think uh, the most interest, one of the most interesting studies, I think, or people to study is Victor Lieberman uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, who has a two-volume work called Strange Parallels which looks at the development of Southeast Asia in the early modern, well, really from about 1000 AD to 1800 in uh, global context and, sh and makes a very robust and powerful case for its importance, not only economic importance and its development, but even in terms of such things as levels of literacy, uh, urbanization, uh, uh, cultural uh, dynamics and things like that. But he's uh, He's not a theorist, he's one of these uh, bulldozer and low gear kind of empiricists. <laughs> but, uh, but I think his work is quite important. One of the problems uh, in, our, uh, in Southeast Asia is much of the work uh, is coming out of a, a variety of areas rather than any one place. There are a lot of, lots coming out of Australia, lots coming out of the UK, work on the Indonesia's coming out of the Netherlands. Uh, there's a lot coming out of the US, although less than there, there used to be. Uh, and really good work coming out of Japan that's not been translated into English yet. So I think that uh, there is not a titanic figure, I don't think, like you know the kind of uh, murderer's row I kind of uh, discussed earlier. But I think there is a lot of good work and some good collective projects uh, that are out there. Yeah. Not every day that you're here at talk making a case for uh, regional studies, but <laughs> in a time when people are trying to dismantle regional studies. Yeah. So I wonder to what extent the studies of Southeast Asia are being captured under the, the tools conventionally used to study globalism, like uh, to mobility and uh, flows and these sorts of things, circulation, and also whether you see any scholarly perils in making a case for regional studies. Yeah, that's a good a good point. You know, like. Uh, Regional, 
uh, or area studies has is, is often been seen as the kiss of death for scholars, especially the social sciences over the last decade or so when people thought that it is, you know, it's kind of minor and too particularistic and not of any generalizability and, and people often poo-pooed the work as somehow inferior. And, and uh, we find a tension, a real tension in Southeast Asia in particular because on the one hand it has been as global as I uh, talked about. There are many global aspects of it for thousands of years, but uh, it, uh, because of the infinite diversity within the region, it really takes a regional specialist to uh, kind of infuse oneself with the, with the language skills and the kind of anthropological uh, experience and knowledge necessary to really drill deeply into the cultures. And this has caused a lot of tensions. I often act as an external reviewer for universities in the area, and the people, the scholars, face this tension all the time. They'll say, my department wants me to publish in you know, the AER, but uh, my work is on Southeast Asia, uh, and when I send it to the, one of these general journals, like the AHR even, you know, they say, oh, this is too regional in, in, in focus. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a difficult problem, but it's, uh, and I think, however, that there are uh, ways to solve it creatively, and I think one way, I think, is to develop uh, groups of scholars and collectivities uh, that brings together some people with a, a more of a global orientation, a more integrative orientation with people that have the uh, in-depth on the ground uh, knowledge of the region uh, and then kind of working together, publishing in a variety of different ways. And I think this could both uh, render regional studies more vital and lead to a deeper uh, understanding of global processes as well. Uh, this is, I'm, I, I'm doing a lunch seminar tomorrow and I was going to talk about some of these possibilities uh, tomorrow and why uh, that might be a good uh, avenue to go to. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I actually uh, grew up in Malaysia for oh. 15 years, so this is a very welcome topic and I agree there's an obvious lack of these sorts of attention. In our I skipped the section on Malaysian food, by the way, which is uh, my favorite. <laughs> That's right, I'll talk oh. it up. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 2007 or so, um, and his argument about notions of temporality being caught up in capitalistic trade, um, insofar as history as we know it, as our discipline, is built on a sense of temporality implicated with ideas about the market. Um, and so kind of our notions about historical time follow the money, as it were, uh, which makes our cultural understanding all the more impoverished, because it's more difficult to extricate ourselves from that market mentality when studying uh, locations that don't correspond to those notions of time. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if um, the primarily economic justifications for studying Southeast Asia might not risk kind of skewing alternative temporalities or periodizations that make greater sense um, in the locales that we're trying to study. So if there are basically any conceptual risks in using trade as our inroads to um, Southeast Asian history. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. but I. I'm an economic historian, and I, uh, there are other ways, uh, approaches to globalization, for example, and there are uh, other ways to approach these studies uh, in a more uh, discreet, embedded way, looking at them. And this has been a, big, a great fight with, within you know, all non-Western communities for a long time. And uh, I have you know, great respect for the, the people who have been doing historo-ethnographic work and who have mastered, uh, you know, the 210 languages of Myanmar uh, and things like that. But uh, as an economic historian, I, I, sa I said, I think at the beginning that I was doing kind of what I called horizontally integrated macro history, and it's really macroeconomic history. And this, I did not mean to deprecate, impugn, or to minimize the importance of other kinds of work by other kinds of scholars. In fact, I rely heavily on it in my own work, particularly the so-called internalists, uh, of which there are many, mostly in, uh, working on Indonesia, uh, uh, whose work is you know, deeply textured and rich, and, uh, in, uh, uh, but I was, uh, the kind of work I do is often, I guess could be uh, 
uh, liken to maybe historical sociology or something, which I'd like to step back a couple of uh, paces and try to look at uh, how this part of the world fits into systemically into a, an emerging world economy. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the same thing that we have some South Asian historians when you talk about medieval India. What the hell does that mean? You know, uh, uh, but that's the, the phrase that people use uh, coming from you know, Western uh, uh, eyes. Yeah. Well, George W. Bush once said, one thing's for certain, the past is history. <laughs> But I feel like, you know, love, love, wonderful quote. But I feel like it's it's interesting how under President Obama's, I guess, last few years, he's pivoting back to, to Southeast Asia after America was sort of so traumatized by its, by its experience in Southeast Asia that we look everywhere else in the, in the globe but there. So I guess, what do you think about what do you think about the, I guess, the the emotional and the cultural the cultural impact that. Southeast Asia had on, on the, I guess, the United States' cultural memory, and were there any dangers to like, going back there with the same attitudes we had the first time? But if, like, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which has been criticized by far left and far right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a good point. It's surprising. I think uh, Southeast Asia, by and large, is, is kind of pro-American, uh, uh, no more, more so than Vietnam uh, today, except maybe with the possible exception of, of Singapore. Uh, you know, they are not because they are so much enamored of the U.S., but they are uh, interested in balancing these great hegemonic powers that uh, have pushed, have often uh, been the 800-pound gorillas nearby, either uh, in this era, China, but in previous areas, sometimes parts of South Asia. And they like the U.S. presence in uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, I think that... Uh, for, uh, the Asian pivot does n is not solely or even mainly uh, uh, on Southeast Asia. It's on Asia as a whole, you know. But if you combine India and China, you have what uh, one point, you have almost forty percent of the world's population, and they add Southeast Asia, and you have half. And so I think President Obama is kind of looking at where the basically. Uh, where much of the world's economic energy uh, will be in the 21st century. And I think he sees potential in Southeast Asia as an area, area that uh, it will be uh, open to the United States' presence there uh, because of the proximity of these two uh, hyper, emerging hyperpowers nearby. Oh, totally. Uh, but it's not surprising, uh, you know, we've done the same thing in the Western Hemisphere at earlier points in our history, and I think that China is acting like a big power in its own backyard. And I think, you know, in many ways the, uh, you know, the New Silk Road project, uh, you know, both over land and uh, via the seas is an attempt to do the same thing, to knit the area more closely together. I mean, it has other reasons as well. It needs, uh, there's a lot of excess capital in uh, China that needs to find a decent investment play. There are big infrastructural needs all over Asia, and the Chinese uh, economy uh, needs, uh, uh, you know, something to, to jolt it a little bit right now. But I think that China is acting, you know, kind of like, uh, the United States or any other power, uh, also with the, A uh, the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. Yeah, sir. Oh, yeah. Well, I was wondering um, about, where, since so much of the historiography of Southeast Asia um, is historiography of trade, I wanted to pick up on Laura's question and ask you about um, how, how perhaps you might locate uh, the relationship between the trade histories and the histories of the agrarian hinterlands, which have, you know, traditionally been ignored mm -hmm. or at least played down in the Southeast Asian, mm -hmm. so the political economy of the, the agrarian hinterlands, mm -hmm. how those play out in your Yeah, as as I said earlier on, there's this huge. Uh, bifurcation in South, or there are many uh, cleavages, but one of the main ones is uh, 
between mainland and island areas, but also between hill and low low lying areas. And the hill countries of or hilly areas of Southeast Asia have largely operated on a whole different kind of set of economic rhythms and routines and were not in the modern era incorporated nearly as fully into these orbits I was talking about. Now earlier on at some points, particularly between about the, the 11th and the 14th or 15th century, some of these mainland areas were very much involved in long distance trade networks, particularly uh, Angor and Bagan and uh, Champa and Diviat and some of these uh, complexes. But uh, you're right, even today, uh, there are you know, massive differences, I think, between the areas that uh, if not, if, uh, are not, if not ungovernable, at least difficult to govern. Much of the problems we see in Myanmar today uh, are, you know, they're oversimplified and reduced in the, in the Western press, but it's basically the lowland Bamar people against the ethnic groups who are in the hilly areas, 135 different ethnic groups against the majority Bamars who have been incorporated into uh, the world economy much, much earlier. One of the things that's also quite interesting, and you could see this, and David mentioned that I do some anthropometric research, uh, I've done some work on, uh, on Myanmar with a uh, Corsican scholar named John uh, Pascal Bassino, and you could even see the world economy inscripted differently on the bodies in terms of height, nutrition, BMIs of people uh, in Myanmar. The areas that were incorporated into the Western economy in the 19th and early 20th century, particularly when a rice export complex was being created, may have grown wealthier, but they shrunk in size uh, because there was uh, uh, a, a kind of disease factors involved in the creation of a rice complex. There were new goods made available. They moved to cities. Uh, while the places outside of the Western market economy in Upper Burma uh, retain the heights that they had earlier. So you can see some of these differences even inscripted on the bodies of, of people. This is not all that different from other parts of the world. There has been something in the United States called the antebellum puzzle uh, in which during the era, eras of early economic growth you often see uh, a, a divergence between material living standards and biological living standards as people begin to substitute the desire for consumer goods for food or they begin to move to cities where it's more congested and there are more pathogens and uh, uh, bio, biological degradation of the body and people often suffer deleterious health for a few generations. But you could use stuff like that really to map some of the distinctions between the different trajectories of areas that were not incorporated as completely into this kind of long distance trade orbits as, as other areas. So it's quite interesting. Uh, uh, and James Scott in his work has really, I think, done a lot with a number of other scholars to uh, capture some of the differences. Most of the work on the people that, uh, that are not as embedded in the world economy has been done by ethnographers and anthropologists rather than historians. There was a question. Oh, hey Joel. So as an American in the U.S. South, you know very well that historical memory can be very divisive, but it can also be very unifying. Mm -hmm. um, last fall, I was in China the week before the largest military parade they've ever had in their <laughs> history. And on TV the whole week were all these historical dramas and documentaries about the war of Japanese aggression, which is what the rest of us call World War II. Yeah. You have this region where you say they don't have a history of, uh, the, of conflict among each other, but they do have a history of these foreign oppressors. <laughs> is, this a, a, is this becoming a fact? I mean, you mentioned they're very pro-American in economic senses, but in terms of culture and history, is this being used as a way to unify these different cultures and countries and economies by using the past and we, you know, the British mm -hmm. or the Japanese <coughs> or the Americans? Is, do you sense that? Yeah, I mean, uh, although it's quite complicated, all of these countries after uh, independence tried to use the past, but uh, in very different ways. And it's quite interesting. The, uh, most of the countries use the colonial past 
to, to uh, try to create you know, a kind of sense of nationhood by uh, uh, being very critical of the coloni so-called uh, colonial regimes and the oppressors. Uh, Burma, for example, throughout almost every Westerner in 1961, almost everyone, uh, started throwing out most of the Indian population right before World War II and the Chinese population. Rangoon was a majority Indian city uh, in the 1930s and now there's only a small population of, of Indian. Singapore, on the other hand, embraced its colonial past and tried to unify people in some ways by uh, uh, trying to use the fact that they had all been colonized by one uh, entity as something that brought unity to a very uh, diverse population of many different Indians, many different types of Chinese and uh, Malay populations. So in all parts of Southeast Asia, I think you see the history being used uh, to create a sense of, of, of nationhood, but um, the tactics. Now, transnational now. Yes. Beyond nations, is it a way to say this is something we all share and have in common? Um, yes, I think, but it's still not as developed as, uh, as many people hope, and there's still not as much a sense of regional unity, I think, as uh, in other uh, geographic groupings around the world. One of the interesting things is while all of these areas were very open to trade during the 19th and 20th centuries, they often didn't trade much with one another. Their, almost all their trade links by that period were imperial in nature. Uh, uh, Vietnam traded more with France than it did with the Philippines or with Burma. Burma traded more with uh, the UK uh, than it did with uh, Siam, uh, right next door to it. And it took a long time, and it is still taking time, uh, for a regional coherence uh, to emerge. One of the problems, again, is the internal diversity in all these places, and then the very complicated uh, histories in each one of these areas, especially the external influences, you know, the Sinic areas. Vietnam, for example, is, is much more heavily influenced by China than these other areas, especially west of the Straits of Malacca. But, and then the, you know, the Indian areas uh, look in a different direction. But that's one of the uh, problems, I think, with ASEAN as a, as a coherent uh, uh, entity. On the other hand, these weak ties may allow uh, uh, people to connect in any number of ways, if, if only loosely, uh, and that, if Granovetter and some of these people are right, might lead to the creation of uh, bigger, if less uh, taught, networks o over time. There was, yeah. So this has been great because on the one hand you can see how this very diverse region, linguistically, culturally, could be conceived of as kind of a unified whole. Right? Mm -hmm. You can think about it in those economic terms. But when I look at that map, it also strikes me there's a lot of religious diversity there. Mm -hmm. um, Hinduism, Buddhism, yeah. Confucianism, I mean, you know, the list goes on and on. And I'm curious if, if that aspect of culture gets compartmentalized as nations and different groups of people think in this macroeconomic uh, sense, as you've sort of talked today, or does religion play a divisive role, right? And, and in what ways is that sort of contributing to this unification you're talking about economically, and in what ways does it inhibit it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It, uh, it, again, there are 11 countries and, the, and, it, and it differs, but it's quite divisive in some of the areas, particularly if there is one very uh, heavily dominant religious group. For example, in a place like Myanmar, which is about 90% or 85%, 90% Theravada Buddhist, minorities uh, don't do too well, particularly Muslims. Uh, in other areas, for example, Singapore, there is this fanatic uh, adherence to respect for all religions. The one thing that will get you in trouble in Singapore more than anything else is 
being disrespectful uh, toward any of the religious, uh, re uh, the, ma the three major religions in the, in, the, in the country. That will get you in more trouble than chewing gum. <laughs> no, you don't really get in trouble for chewing gum, but, uh, but that'll get you in a lot of trouble. Indonesia, for example, traditionally has been pretty moderate in its uh, uh, acceptance and toleration of non-Muslim uh, groups. It's a kind of tolerant form of Sunni Islam for the most part, but you know it's coming under uh, some contestation. It becomes more tricky because many of the Muslims are uh, non-Muslims are also Chinese. And there's uh, some uh, an, uh, historic animosity between Chinese Indonesians and um, Malayo Indonesians. Uh, in places like Vietnam, which are uh, heavily Sinic and you know somehow either Confucian Buddhist, there aren't that many minorities except a small small number of Catholics and Muslims in the south, and it's not quite as uh, much of a problem. In Malaysia, it's sometimes been a problem and sometimes isn't. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Indian Tamils who, uh, in Malaysia who are either uh, uh, Catholic or usually Episcopalian or Methodist, and then there are Chinese and you know, a majority uh, Muslim. So all of these countries are, are, uh, handle the question differently, but religion is an important uh, is important really in all of these places, I think, to a greater or lesser extent. It's much more of a kind of religious kind of uh, uh, set of societies than uh, we would see in a more secularized uh, region of the world. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah so I'm going to go back to uh, Samir's question first about the initial question. I noticed that when you, you, you answered primarily in relation to uh, mainland South Asia. Not to <laughs> I wonder if we think about that question through island Southeast Asia over the long duration. Mm -hmm. um, and here I'm thinking of relations, relations between hinterlands and um, the lower areas. Yeah. If we might get a different answer, um, and, that, and if that also might help us think a little bit about Lawrence's question um, regarding the, the sort of place of region in transnational space. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking of, um, you know, there's a very rich tradition in the historiography, uh, especially from about the early modern period. People like um, Barbara and Daya, mm -hmm. um, and then going all the way back to BJ Shreddy, mm -hmm. um, of thinking about local translocal trade and thinking about hinterlands mm -hmm. as being in part what constitutes that, that translocal mm -hmm. system, right? That they're not in conflict, but right. actually you, you get that because of sort of local right. relations. So I'm just wondering if we can think about both of these questions differently by separating the region in that way. Well, I think, I think you see this uh, distinction uh, between kind of uh, I don't know what you call it, local hill, less, mark, less long distance trade oriented areas, even in insular Southeast Asia as well. Uh, that is to say, many parts of the Philippines, many of the islands in uh, the Indonesian archipelago, many of the hilly areas in the air, uh, are much less involved in these circuits than are others. And even today in Indonesia, many of the people living on the 13,500 to 17,000 islands other than Java and to a lesser extent Sumatra feel that they are being kind of internally colonized uh, by those two areas uh, and that there are real sharp distinctions uh, even there. But I think that some of the uh, differences that I articulated that I was mentioning examples from the mainland uh, also hold in, in Indonesia and in uh, uh, the island, insular Malaysia, and in the Philippines as well. Much of the Philippines was outside of uh, these uh, transnational long distance orbits that I was talking about, and still are today, actually. Although, you know, the South was Muslim <laughs> since the 16th century. Yeah. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. Please join well, me thank you very much. Thank you.